Shalom, everybody. And welcome back, finally, again, to another installment of the Midrash series with me, Batya, in spot as usual. Filming in a different place today because I wanted to make sure I had all of my tools for learning Torah. <laughs> it's funny as a parent what you will find laying around your house. We're going to act out the Parsha with the dinosaur and the cheetah. Okay. Good. All right. It's been a while. Summer's crazy. Summer is a crazy thing. We passed this period of the three weeks. And now I, I try generally not to talk about the year where we are because I want to make the Midrash videos. So anybody at any time, Bizrat Hashim, can come and watch and it's just kind of on the Parsha so they don't get lost in what's happening within the year. But I feel like it is important to talk about where we are in the calendar because it is super meaningful. August 28th, that is going to be the first day of Elul, the month of Elul. Elul is a very special month. Um, it's taught that the, an acronym, acronym, acronym. The abbreviation of these letters for the month Elul is Anila Dodi Dodili. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. And it's a time where they say the king is in the field. And that in this time, God comes to us. And this is a month of preparation before the coming of the new year, Rosh Hashanah. And it's funny, like I hear, I mean, people say the Jewish new year, <laughs> but it's not just the Jewish New Year. It's the new year for every living thing. People, animals, tree, flower, bush, shrub, you name it. Everything um, is judged. Your book is pulled out and reviewed. Absolutely every single thing, every blade of grass. So this is absolutely everyone's new year. And so Elul is the preparatory month before the new year to do what we call Cheshbon and Nefesh, to do a spiritual accounting, accounting of the soul. Um, not only being forgiven and asking for forgiveness and making repentance on the mistakes that I've made, but also really finding that space to forgive other people for the mistakes that they've made. Because it's something that we talked about I mean, mamash, so many times that God can forgive you for the way that you sin against him. He, however, cannot, I mean, God forbid, I don't like to say anything God can't do anything, but he can't forgive you for how you wrong another person. It's not his place. You have to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. Also, it's important to note that sometimes there are situations where we repeatedly ask for forgiveness and that person's not willing to give. We have an obligation to ask for forgiveness three times and then... After that, you know, we, we made our effort. But um, So we're in a month to start to kind of be more reflective, to feel Hashem coming close to us, and getting ready to kind of embrace all the new possibility of what's coming. Because it's so interesting to think that everything that's happening right now was already written the year before. But it's so exciting because it's new. It has that possibility that anything can happen. And hopefully the thing that will happen will be the Beit HaMikdash and the Mashiach. May it be speedily in our days. Now, Batya, come on. Enough jibber-jabber. Let's get down to business. Okay, friends, dear friends. We're going to go over right now the laws of Yom Kippur. Don't quit on me. It's not just what you think. There's also other things in here uh, that are interesting and good. I hope you will find. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, starting, hey guys, let's learn the laws of Yom Kippur, which is good because it's actually coming. So, at least it's kind of relevant. Okay. Batya, blah, blah, blah. Women, nine part speech out of ten. That's what the Torah teaches us. All right, the Torah describes the laws of Yom Kippur, which apply to each individual. They are fasting, a 25-hour fast, abstention from work, 
like similar to that of Shabbat, right? Partaking of food on Yom Kippur is punishable by karet, excision. Besides fasting, our sages enumerated as forbidden on Yom Kippur, washing or refreshing oneself, using cosmetics or perfumes, wearing leather shoes, and marital relations. By abstaining from these, we fulfill the Torah commandment. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls. The Torah continues, for on that day, he will forgive you to cleanse you. You will be purified from all of your sins before Hashem. But of course, you know, um, it's interesting because even on Yom Kippur, it, it's, it's a most serious day. But the fasting on Yom Kippur is not really about affliction. The fasting on Tisha B'Av, the destruction of the temples, that's about afflicting oneself. The fast on Yom Kippur is really about not needing food. Like I, I am above that in this place with these prayers and this, this level of connection to God. I am like an angel. I do not even require food. I, I don't need anything from this worldly plane. So it's a different kind of fasting and not so much a fast of affliction. Why was the 10th of Tishrei chosen to become the day of atonement for all generations? Having sought pardon in vain for the Chet Egil, the sin of the golden calf during two stays in heaven, Moshe again ascended to the top of Har Sinai for a third time on the 29th of Av. For 40 days, he was absorbed in constant tefillah prayer. The entire Jewish people to spend this period praying and fasting, and on the 10th of Tishrei, at the end of 40 days, Hashem finally announced to Moshe, I have pardoned according to your word. And as a sign of his forgiveness, he inscribed the Ten Commandments on the second pair of Luchot, the Luchot, or the tablets, which Moshe had hewn. On the tenth of Tishrei, Moshe brought these new tablets to the people and informed them of the divine pardon. The quality of divine forgiveness, though, is inherent in Yom Kippur since creation. It returns annually at this date, for which sins is a Jew pardon on Yom Kippur. For which sins is a Jew pardoned on Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur can atone for transgressions committed against Hashem. However, it will not absolve someone from a wrong committed against his fellow man unless he first seeks the victim's forgiveness. Someone who is lax with Torah commandments throughout the year and thinks in his heart, I will be forgiven by Hashem at Yom Kippur. This man is not pardoned at Yom Kippur. And, of course, when I say man, I mean human humans, men and women. Certain transgressions are so grave that even repentance, tshuva, and the observance of Yom Kippur do not earn complete atonement. In this category belong willful transgressions of Torah commandments that entail karet, excision. It is only partially atoned by repentance in Yom Kippur. The remaining debt must be erased by suffering. Another sin expiated neither by repentance nor Yom Kippur, and not even by additional suffering, is that of Chilul Hashem, the desecration of Hashem's name. Only death fully exonerates a Jew from that major offense, which contradicts the very purpose of his existence. So, one historic Yom Kippur, the entire people ate and drank and were praised by Hashem. When Shlomo Amalek, King Shlomo, Solomon, built the Beit HaMikdash, Yom Kippur occurred during its seven inauguration days. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, decided that not only must the inauguration sacrifices for the temple be offered, but moreover, the people must cook, eat, and drink on Yom Kippur, or else the happiness of the inauguration would be incomplete. The Torah empowers the Sanhedrin to permit temporarily certain Torah prohibitions if they feel the circumstances require it. Strange and unusual as this Yom Kippur was for the people who were accustomed to the yearly fast, they obeyed. Thereby, they fulfilled the commandment not to deviate from the ruling of the Torah sages of the generation, even if they should decide concerning the left that it is right and concerning the right that it is left. This is so interesting because this is something that you'll, I, I feel, I don't know, something that I always heard talked about. Make yourself a rav, and if he says left is left or right is right, you listen to him. And I once heard someone say something very interesting. I wish I could remember, but he said, why does it say, why does it say, um, if they should decide concerning the left that it is right and concerning the right that it is left to trust them and not if it is black, it is white. And if it's white, it is black. Because if someone looks at something 
they can see if it's white or black. They don't need a Rav to tell them um, if it's white or black. But left and right can be mixed up depending on where you're standing. And so it's depending on perspective, in that situation you would ask a Rav because he would have the perspective. Subsequently, however, a segment of the population worried that Hashem was displeased with the feasting on Yom Kippur, and a heavenly voice, in Hebrew we call that a bat kol, then reassured them by proclaiming, you are all destined for a portion in the world to come. In the Torah view, fasting is not the loftiest accomplishment. Um, consuming a meal in sanctity may be greater than abstaining from food. At the temple's inauguration, the entire people were elevated after seeing the cloud of glory descending and filling the Beit HaMikdash. Purified after witnessing this event, their eating subsequently was similar to the sacrifices of Yom Kippur and their drinking to the wine offering poured upon the altar. The bat kol, the heavenly voice, therefore assured them that they had not incurred the karet penalty, for which is the penalty for partaking food on Yom Kippur. On the contrary, they earned a portion in the next world since Hashem considered their having eaten Lashem Shemaim in the spirit of Kedusha, equivalent to offering up the sacrifices of Yom Kippur. Uh, and, and this is interesting again because this year, Tisha B'Av, our fast day, fell on Shabbat. And so it was pushed off because Shabbat comes first. And so not only was eating and feasting and celebrating having meat, you know, because in the week leading up, we don't eat meat at all. But on Shabbos, we eat meat, we drink wine, and we're doing it on this fast day, the saddest, saddest of day, and it's a great mitzvah. There's a great story. Two very great scholarly brothers, Rav Zusha and Rav Elimelech. And uh, they really like to kind of run around with the common people and kind of mix in and, you know, talk tour with them and hanging out with, you know, these kinds of people. Sometimes they get scooped up and put in jail. And one day they were put in jail. And time was approaching for them to dive in the mincha prayer in the afternoon. But there was a problem. There was a bucket of waste in the cell. And you cannot dive in, in front of a bucket of waste. And so Eli Melech was pacing. And he was so upset about this that he was going to lose the prayer time to, to pray mincha. And he wasn't going to be able to do this mitzvah. And he wasn't going to be able to do this mitzvah. And his brother said, Eli Melech, why are you so sad? The same God that commanded you that you have to daven mincha is the same God that commanded you that you're not allowed to daven in front of a bucket of waste. So why is one more or less than the other? Both were commanded by Hashem. Both are equally great. You can't do this mitzvah, but God told you because it's this mitzvah. And at hearing that, Rav Elimelech started to clap and sing and dance. And then they both stood up and the police guards came over and they're like, what's going on? And obviously the other people in the cell, they didn't know really what they were talking about. And so they just pointed to the, the bucket of waste in the corner. And they're like, I don't know. They just kept talking. They're pointing at the waste and they, they're dancing. And the guard's like, oh, yeah, if it's that bucket of waste that makes them so happy, then I'm going to come and take it away. And he took it out and they were able to daven mincha. I like this story. Let's keep going. Where are we? Okay. The prohibition against slaughtering sacrifices outside the Mishkan. Before the Mishkan was erected, a Jew was permitted to slaughter a sacrifice to Hashem on any private altar which he built. Once the Mishkan was established, however, the Almighty commanded that no more sacrifices be offered up outside its central altar, not even a small sacrifice like a bird. I believe, and I totally could be wrong, and there's many, many people in the world that would know this better than I do, but I think that technically, legally... It's still allowed for a Noahide to bring a private altar, uh, to a private sacrifice on a private, to bring a sacrifice on a private altar, which is super interesting, right? That's cool. Okay, so once the Mishkan in the wilderness was erected, and later after the Beit Hamikdash in Jerusalem was built, Hashem saw fit that all Jews should sacrifice only there. Offering all the sacrifices in one central place removes us from the practices of the nations who used to bring sacrifices into the field so that the demons could consume the blood. Furthermore, a Jew was influenced positively when he visited the Mishkan or Beit HaMikdash. The great holiness of the site strengthened his fear of God and made him re-accept the Almighty's authority upon himself. Since a visit to the Beit HaMikdash elevated a Jew spiritually, his sacrifices truly achieved atonement for him. Kisui Hadam, the covering of 
the blood. Hashem commanded, if someone slaughters a beast or a bird to consume its meat, he must cover its blood with earth on the top and on the bottom after slaughtering. The mitzvah of covering the blood is in effect today too. After slaughtering a bird or a wild beast, the shochet, the ritual slaughterer, recites the blessing, Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his mitzvot and commanded us concerning the covering of the blood. Thereafter, he covers the blood both from underneath and from above. The Midrash explains that the reason for this mitzvah is linked to the previous commandment not to slaughter on a private altar in open. If a Jew would find in a field the blood of an animal slaughtered by someone for private use, he might incorrectly assume that it was blood of a sacrifice. Believing that another Jew had sacrificed outside the Mishkan, he might have been tempted to imitate the deed. In order to prevent this sin, the Torah commanded that all blood be covered. According to the Sefer Achinuk, devouring the flesh while the animal's blood is still in full view would instill in our souls some kind of some of those characteristics of cruelty and animalism from which the Torah seeks to wean us, concealing the slaughtered animal's lifeblood before partaking of its flesh, shows refinement and dignity and develops the spiritual nature within us. The Torah did not include domesticated animals in the mitzvah of covering of the blood. Okay. Forbidden marital relations. The moral corruption, in Hebrew that's called arayot. Arias. You can hear it said Arias or Arayot. The moral corruption of the Egyptians reached its zenith at the time when the Jews came there. Of all parts of Egypt, those bordering on the Jewish quarters exceeded the others in lewdness. Yet even in this cauldron of depravity, the moral purity of the Jewish family life remained intact. Now, Bnei Israel were on their way to Eretz Canaan, a country which, like Egypt, condoned the lowest types of perversion. I implore you, Hashem entreated the Jewish people, upon arriving in the country, remain worthy of the title, A Rose Among Thorns. The Almighty dictated to Moshe a list of forbidden marital relations, remarking, I know that the Jews are of refined nature and intrinsically above the atrocities mentioned here. Nevertheless, I am enumerating them in full detail because they are common among the nations and even the greatest tzaddik is susceptible to his environment. The forbidden relations include marital relations with one's close relatives, marrying both a mother and a daughter, marrying a wife's sister while the wife is still alive, adultery with a married woman, cohabitation with one of the same sex, cohabitation with animals, marital relations or any intimate contact with Anita, a woman who is during her time of her menstrual period and even after uh, she is considered Anita until she has gone to the mikvah. Um, so some of, uh, some of what I mentioned, these forbidden relations, if transgressed willfully, are punishable by death at the hands of a bad dean. For others, the correct punishment is pronounced upon a deliberate sinner. Why is this sin punishable by correct, like such extreme measures? Because immorality is abhorrent to God. We know this. God is holy. He tells us, be holy because I'm holy. Uh, though I highly doubt God said cuz. <laughs> um, and so a person who stoops to moral depravity thereby removes himself from his creator. Devising a plan to exterminate the Jewish people, the Evit prophet Bilam, can he counseled... So sad. It's such a, Bilam counseled the Balak... Um, Telling Balak went to him to find out how we could like uh, attack the Jews, and Bilam says, "Hey, there's something that their God really doesn't like. Their God hates immorality, sexual immorality. He's not into." So he said, "The the Midian girls." He told them this plan, and unfortunately, it worked like a charm. They went and they got tents, like stores, right? And at first, they put old ladies at the front. Then once they went in, there were young, beautiful women. Even the daughter of the king himself. And this resulted in the death of 24,000 Jews. Uh, and, and not only did they have intimate relations with these women, but the women got them to bow and do certain things before idols. Tragedy. Anyway, the point of that story is the God of Israel is not a fan of sexual immorality. 
Okay, caret, the excision penalty. What is the definition of caret mentioned repeatedly in the Torah, especially lately uh, in, in our, what we're learning? There are three types of possible excision. Caret of physical life, caret of the soul, and caret of the body and the soul. So a Jew who is basically righteous but lost control over himself by transgressing one of the Torah prohibitions punishable by caret passes away before the age of 60. In other words, the first category of karet implies that one's lifespan is cut short. Nevertheless, this Jew's soul will live on after death, meriting a portion in the world to come. A Jew whose sins outnumber his merits is termed a rasha. If he commits a transgression calling for karet, his soul will be severed from the divine source of life in the world to come. Karet of the soul is inflicted, for example, upon a rasha who engaged in some of the forbidden for <laughs> forbidden marital relations or on such a person who eats chametz on uh, leaven dough on Pesach or on a person who eats or performs labor on Yom Kippur. The most severe type of karet is excision from both this world and from the next, meaning dying at a young age and losing one's portion in the next world, Olam Abba. This type of karet is uh, pronounced upon an idol worshiper, one who blasphemes the Almighty and other sinners guilty of severe transgressions, enumerated specifically in Gemara Shavuot 13a. Hashem inflicts severe punishment for moral depravity. Now, usually the Almighty exercises restraint when dealing with even any sinner, really. Hashem always tries to give us time to repent and do tshuva. I mean, obviously, it makes sense. There would be no free choice if I did something bad or I sinned and immediately I got hit <laughs> with the punishment. God pulls off the punishment hoping, hoping that we can make repentance and to give us free choice. However, if people become morally depraved, Hashem takes action without delay. He punishes not only the sinful individuals, but causes catastrophic plagues to sweep across the land and wreak large-scale destruction. For example, Hashem brought a universal flood in the time of Noah. One of the main reasons for the punishment was that the generation indulged in forbidden relations. When angels came to Lot's house to inform him of the impending destruction on Sodom, he pleaded with Hashem that he spare the city. But the Sodomite populace learned of the arrival of the guests of Lot's at the guests. When the inhabitants of Sodom learned about the guests at Lot's house, you say it three times fast. <laughs> and they were banging on the door and they were like, give us these men for immoral purposes, right? When God saw that, as soon as they made the demand on the angels, uh, the angel said to Lot, don't continue to pray on their behalf. It's in vain, for their fate has been sealed because of their immorality. Take your family and escape, for we are destroying this place. Hashem says, I punish Shimshon, Amnon, and Zimri for the sin of immorality, and I will punish anyone who acts as they did. In contrast to the generation of the flood and the inhabitants of Sodom, the three individuals that I just mentioned are considered righteous, yet they had to suffer bitterly because they stumbled in a sin involving immorality. Shimshon, the judge Shimshon was destined to be a holy man. Even before he was born, an angel instructed his mother that he was to be a lifelong Nazir. A Nazir is a very poorly translated to like monk, but they just abstain from specific things such as cutting their hair or drinking wine um, and other things. But he was selected by Hashem for the task of single-handedly fighting the Plishtim. He had to mix with them and marry one of their daughters so as to gain opportunities to stir up strife between them and the Jews and thereafter avenge their attacks. Shimshon's personality and task were of so elevated a nature that our forefather Yaakov, who prophetically envisioned his life story, initially believed that it would be um, Shimshon himself that was the harbinger of the Mashiach and usher in the, uh, the final, the Geula, the final redemption. However, Shimshon failed in his difficult mission. When he announced to his parents that he was about to marry a certain Plishtin girl, he said to them, Get her for me if she is pleasing to my eyes. 
Although he intended to marry the girl Hashem Shemaim for the sake of heaven in order to be able to harass the Plishtim, and his marriage to a Plishtim girl was approved by heaven, he felt because he chose the girl who was pleasing in his eyes. He was to have viewed the girl with absolute objectivity. Once the slightest tins tinge of personal desire colored his motives, which should have been purely spiritual, it signaled a moral decline in his character, which eventually led to his downfall. And as Hashem does, working in measure for measure, mida connected mida, Shimshon was punished measure for measure, retribution, his eyes. Because he, did, he sinned with his eyes, he was punished, uh, uh, he was blinded by the plishti. Amnon, the son of David. Oh, this story is so... Amnon caused himself to be punished with death because he did not control his desires, as is recounted in the book of Samuel, in the book of Shmuel, too. No, maybe. What is it? No, I think it's, yeah, Second Shmuel, Second Samuel, chapter 13, I believe. Amnon grew up in the royal palace together with Tamar, and although she was not actually his sister according to Torah law, um, they did share David as a parent. Uh, he knew that she would not be able to be given to him in marriage for various reasons. And at the advice of an evil friend, Yonadav, he consequently devised an evil opportunity to be alone with her and forced her to submit to his will. Tamar's brother, Avshalom, avenged the deed by having Amnon murdered. As a result of these incidents, the Beit Din prohibited a Jewish man to be privately secluded with a girl, even an unmarried girl. Uh, these are called laws of Ichud, a seclusion. And uh, I think we've talked about that a little before. And the third, Zimri. Zimri brought about the greatest tragedy of the three individuals who were punished for immorality. Besides being slain himself, he brought the death of 24,000 other Jews, as we will talk about once we get further down the line and out of Leviticus. Just kidding. It's not called Leviticus. It's called Baikra. Okay. Eretz Israel. The land of Israel cannot tolerate sin. Although moral depravity is punishable wherever it, is occur wherever it occurs, in Eretz Israel, it calls for special punishment, exile of the inhabitants. How is Eretz Israel different from other countries on earth? This phenomenon can be better understood by means of a parable. The food served to the labor camp inmates was dirty and thrown to them in unwashed bowls. Those who came from poor and simple backgrounds had previously been exposed to hardship, swallowed the unabashed appetizing meals. Others, however, who were only used to refined food, served in spotless dishes. Although hunger forced them to overcome their disgust and gulp it down, their delicate stomachs could not hold it. Whatever they ate, they would subsequently vomit. Of all the lands in the world, Eretz Israel possesses the highest level of Kedusha because it's where God's throne sits, the house of God, the guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. She is therefore, as it were, most sensitive to any evil commitment on her holy soil. If her inhabitants become corrupt and transgress Hashem's will, her refined constitution is unable to tolerate them. She therefore inevitably vomits them forth and they are exiled. This is a real thing. You know, I, uh, I just had a friend move and uh, she was really sad and she said that she she felt disappointed because it's a well-known thing here that if you don't get to stay and you want, it's because the land is removing you from itself. And she said that she felt like she didn't have the merit. And that's why she was going. But you'd have to know this woman to know that she's such a light to the world. It's not the only reason people get sent out of Israel. People also get sent out of Israel to do their work. We were scattered into the nations to be a light amongst the nations, including our own nation. And um, I, I'm sure she has some very holy avoda where she's going. But it's still a very well-known concept here that there's a different energy here. Things move different in Israel. And, and, and not only will it kick kick you out of the land but it will move you to whatever place it wants you to live it will squeeze you 
I, I, you can really mamish feel the divine providence in Israel because you can you can feel here. I I don't know maybe it's just where I live that people will say it, but you really feel the hand of God guiding you, like it very strongly. <laughs> but that would make sense, right? The Holy Land. All right, let's keep going. We're doing good. Now, so this is one of the reasons why no nation which attempted to settle permanently in Eretz Israel, formerly called Eretz Canaan, succeeded in doing so. One after, and you see this in history, right? One after another, the nations were banished from the country. New settlers in turn were expelled since they did not conform to the expected standard of Kedusha holiness either. The nation which occupied the land the longest were the Canaanim. Yet, as we explain, uh, that the Canaanim were the lewdest of the nations. Should they not then have been immediately expelled from Eretz Israel? Our sages explain that they deserved a long respite in the land, among other reasons, for two things. They were rewarded for having accorded honor to the Tzadik Avram. When Avram asked Bnei to sell him the burial place for Sarah, they addressed him as a prince of God and assisted him in its acquisition. For honoring and being of the service to the great Tzadik Avram, they merited a prolonged stay in the land. Two Hashem allowed the Kananim to remain in Eretz Israel for a long period of time for the sake of the Bnei Israel, to whom he had promised the land fulfilled with good and precious things. So during the 40 years before the Jews arrived there, the Kananim built houses, they planted trees. The Bnei Israel then found a country which produced the most gorgeous fruits, and they were gigantic, like each individual fruit. It was like a grape was the size of your head. Can you even imagine such a thing? Hashem granted Kananim a reprieve so that they should labor for the benefit of Bnei Israel, who would later enter and assume the possession of the land. However, now, before the Jews settled in Eretz Israel, Hashem warned them, Do not think that your permanent residence in the land is guaranteed. Do not defile yourselves with the abominations with which the previous inhabitants defiled Eretz Israel, so that the land not vomit you out when you defile it as it has vomited out the other nations before you. Vayikra chapter 18, verse 28. When the Bnei Israel imitated the practices of the nations around them, the divine warning took effect and they suffered defeats in their battles and finally were driven into exile. The divine Torah was written for all generations and it warns us that permanent settlement in Eretz Israel is contingent upon a standard a level of Kedusha which conforms with the intrinsic holiness of the land. Else our fate will be no different from that of our forefathers and all of the nations whose lewdness could not be tolerated by the land. Yeah. Yep. All right. Safeguards against immorality. When describing the forbidden relations, the Torah employs the special expression, you shall not approach them. Consequently, our sages instituted the laws of Ichud, which forbid a man to be in private seclusion with a strange woman. Uh, he should also not chat with a strange woman. The precautions to guard oneself from immorality are not as may be thought of old-fashioned prudence with which we could dispense in our modern age. Rather, the Almighty who fashioned the human soul is the greatest psychologist who knows the dynamic urges and instincts which he implanted in all living beings. He therefore commanded us to take precautionary measures against immorality, an area which provides the greatest of testing grounds. If the instinct is harnessed and employed for purpose of Kedusha, it attaches a person to his creator and causes the Shechina to reside in our midst. If let loose in the style of the nations of the world, it debases to the level of the animal. And that's the human being, half godlike, half animal. Which is stronger? Whichever one you feed. Right? Where are we? The Almighty joined his great name, so that of several people who fled from immorality. So there are a couple people specifically mentioned for, that God loves them so much because they just ran away from immorality. One, I'm pretty sure you can guess. Yosef at Tzadik, Nachon. And the other one is Palti bin Laish. Now, Yosef was exposed to daily enticements and pressures by Potiphar's wife, yet he did not sin. 
Said Hashem, you will be rewarded measure for measure for each act of abstention from immorality. Since he did not bend his neck to sin, Pyro adorned it with a golden necklace. His hands were not stretched out sinfully, and therefore Pyro's ring was placed upon them. His body remained pure, and therefore it was clothed with linen garments. His feet did not walk to sin, and therefore Hashem caused him to ride in a royal carriage. His thoughts did not indulge in sinful images, and therefore he was proclaimed a father in wisdom. And as the final crowning achievement, Yosef was renamed Yehosef, with the letter He of Hashem's name added to him to imply that the Almighty himself bore witness to the fact that Yosef HaTzadik did not sin. Amazing. The Almighty also associated his name with Palti bin Laish, who practiced superior restraint in guarding himself from immorality and outshone even Yosef. Yosef faced temptation during one year, but Palti did for many years. Yosef withstood enticement in a clearly sinful situation, but Palti in one which could have been justifiably legal. King Shaul, Shaul Amalek, Saul, um, who considered his daughter Michal's marriage to King David invalid for certain halachic reasons, spitefully gave her in marriage to another man, Palti. Palti, though, was God-fearing, and all the years during which he, at the king's command, was officially Michal's husband, did not touch her. He would not involve himself in an act which might possibly have constituted immorality. The verse honors him by renaming him Paltiel in Shmuel uh, chapter 3 verse 15, attaching God's name to his. Paltiel's conduct made him the paragon of self-control in matters pertaining to immorality. By removing himself from immorality, a person becomes associated with the Almighty. A special reward is assured to someone who inadvertently saw some sort of obscenity but did not allow himself to gaze at it concerning him it is said in uh, isaiah chapter 33 verse 15 one who shuts his eyes from watching evil your eyes shall behold the king in his beauty and they shall see the land that is far off the midrash explains um, that he will be rewarded with an experience of beholding the shechina um, yet i do feel compelled to also mention um that it's also taught that if there is a path that has lewd things on the way and you take this path and you are totally righteous and you do not look at anything inappropriate on the way, when you come out the other side, you are still a sinner. Why would you put yourself in a situation where you can fall down? You think Hashem's going to make a miracle for you? Do you deserve a miracle? We can't bet on that. We don't know if we're worthy of miracles. And the assumption there is problematic. So it says that even if you go dafka purposefully on a path with lewdness and you don't look when you come out the other end, you're still wicked because you should have gone a direction without the traps. Don't trust yourself to the day that you die. Do not trust yourself to the day that you die. You've seen it in your life. I know you've seen it, not just me. Even to me, like, you know, like, sometimes it's so funny. I think like when I say like, I'm not the kind of person that I find myself like right after that, almost immediately doing whatever I just said that I don't do. Like, people are funny. Humans. Human beings are funny. Okay, let's keep going. How are we doing on time? Not too shabby. Here we go. We're all, um, okay, here we go. Now, do not deliver children to the Molech priests. Hashem warned the children of Israel, do not give any of your children to pass through the fire of Molech. The prohibition is mentioned again in the uh, Parsha of Kedoshim, which is coming up after this. We're in Achrei Mot right now. How was the, the worship of Molech performed? It was customary to set up two fires and pass the child between the fires. Most, excuse me, that was like a yawn that didn't come out. Most famous commentators believe that it, it doesn't literally mean putting a child in fire. There's fire and they pass them through as a ritual. According to the Rambam and Rashi. I have 15% left on my phone. I wonder how long that's going to take us. I guess we'll just finish this up. Oh, shucks. Because they're, okay. All right, let's do it. Now, the um, 
The Yalkut describes the Moloch rite differently. The Moloch was represented by a statue of the calf's face with outstretched human hands. Its stomach was hollow to enable the priest to light a fire inside. In front of it, it was customary to erect seven chambers. If a person brought a bird sacrifice, he was told to offer it in the first chamber, a sheep in the second, a lamb in the third, a calf in the fourth, a bull in the fifth, an ox in the sixth, entry to the seventh and innermost chamber, chamber. Innermost chamber, the idol's residence was reserved for one who brought his son as a sacrifice. And the father would kiss the idol. Then the priest lit the fire inside it until its hand became glowing hot. The child was placed in the palm of the molech. The screams and shrieks of the child were drowned by the loud rhythmic drum beating of the priest, which accompanied the ceremony. The molech priest used to threaten and intimidate all parents, warning them that unless they satisfied molech's demands, the god would become incensed and wreak vengeance upon the entire family, slaying all of their other children. Since it was particularly the women who became frightened by this menace, the Torah warned it in strongest terms to resist the threats and promises of the priests. If a Jewish parent had previously warned and thereafter two witnesses observed him deliver his child to the mullet priest, the Beit Din executed him and he was punished by stoning. In the absence of witnesses, or if the witnesses were afraid to testify, Hashem threatened the father with a type of karet punishment which entails premature death and the passing away of his children. In other words, the Torah warns that by complying with the Moloch's priest demands, the parents will not only, as they think, secure their child's health and happiness, on the contrary, it will bring death upon the children that they're trying to protect. While a parent is punished with death for delivering a child to the Molech, all the sinner's relatives are punished by Hashem with suffering as well. If a member of a family dares to commit an atrocity, it reflects on the entire family, for they probably did not take a strong enough stand to protest and prevent their relative from committing this heinous crime. Our sages teach that a Jew who delivers not only one or many of his children, but all of his children to the Molech, is exempt from capital punishment from the, the Jewish court. What? Why would a man that gave all of his children be exempt from capital punishment from the Jewish court? And the Torah comes to teach us. Capital, capital, capital punishment is ordained by the Torah for the sinner's benefit. His physical death expiates his sin, securing him a portion in the world to come. The crime of a Jew who delivered all of his children to the Molech, however, is beyond atonement through mere physical death. His sin has branded itself so deeply into his soul that capital punishment cannot atone for him and therefore loses its purpose. He will be purged by the suffering of Gehenom in the world to come. The Almighty condemns the Moloch cult as an abomination, saying in Vayikra, chapter 20, verse 3, And I will set my face against the man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given his offspring to the Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane the name of my holiness. By offering a child to the idol, a Jew causes a chilul Hashem and banishes the Shechina from Klal Israel, the nation of Israel. Um, of the idolatrous... Oh, man. Come on, Batya. Ahaz. The king Ahaz. He was married to Jezebel. Jezebel. Who ruled the kingdom of Yehuda. Okay. Uh, and we're in 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, verse 3. And he also made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations. Ahaz delivered his little son, Hiskiao, to the priests to have him burned. However, Hiskiao's mother had previously uh, impregnated his skin with the blood of a type of creature resembling a salamander, thus rendering it fireproof. This was a special creature bred in a fire of um, Hasidim twigs, which burned for seven continuous years. One who smears blood on his skin became immune to fire. Hashem created the salamander-like creature, especially to ensure the survival of this great Sadi King Hiskiao, to save him from the fire of the idol. Even though Moloch cult, in the actual sense of the world, is non-existent today, um, the application of the mitzvot has bearings upon us too. So uh, now, in more practical, actually, I think the world is crazy. I don't know what we think we know or what we don't know about things like this and what is or isn't done. Nothing new under the sun. That's all I'm going to say. But in a more modern interpretation of this, they also call passing your child through the files of Molech uh, public school, which is really interesting because it's so relevant now. 
uh, with what is being taught. I mean, thank God not here, my big, but, uh, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm American, so I'm thinking about America, what's being taught in American schools, and uh, how giving your children to these people to teach them all these things, which are the complete antithesis to what God likes. And, and I mean, God might not talk to us uh, uh, like blatantly, but he gave us a love letter called the Torah that tells us very clearly what he likes and what he does not like. And we're sacrificing our children to these people, teaching them things that are completely at war with God. Uh, it's so wild. Uh, it's so wild. Anyway, Hashem should protect all of our children. Physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, Dafka. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and end there. Next part is Kedoshim. Kedoshim is really, really, really interesting and very, very special because aside from giving the Ten Commandments publicly, men, women, and children, the only other thing that was given publicly specifically to men, women, and children all at the same time is going to be the Parshat Kedoshim. It's kind of like, wow, God's hits now, 2022. No, you know, you know those CDs back in the old day. Wow, now that's hits. So Kedushim is just a list of some of God's favorite things, which is good. It's a cheat sheet for us to know how to find grace in our Creator's eyes. I'm going to leave it there. Let me change my old bookmark. Hashem, thank you for letting me do this. Thank you for anyone who actually watched this. I hope you got something interesting. Um, it's already Thursday, so I'm going to wish everybody a big fat Shabbat Shalom. And I hope to see you early next week as we make our way through the book of Vayikra. As always, my dear friends, Tov Lahot Odeshem.